and Steve Giuliano. Just about and... to go live, by the way. Sorry, guys. Okay, cool. We will talk a bit, right. bit about online as well. I think that'd be a good subject. You do quite a bit online, yeah. Tanya. Yeah, yeah, it's been picking up that. Cool. Really cool. <clears throat> Hopefully, we'll get some good questions as well. Cool. You've been watching much of the golf, Dane? Do you catch much of the golf? Yeah. On the... yeah, I have it. Yeah, I've been watching quite a bit of it. I've got a Sky Sports podcast on Tuesday and we're covering it, so I need to I'm kind of swatting up on it. Yeah. Just yeah. On, I mean, up on the Bryson story. I've enjoyed uh, I've enjoyed some of those podcasts that you've done on there. They've been really good. Yeah, yeah they're good fun, actually. Josh does them really good. Um, yeah, yeah, they're a bit of fun as well, aren't they? Not too serious. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. They're decent. Definitely. Okay, gallery view. Right, we're going to go gallery view, I think. Okay, guys, it's 10 o'clock here in Singapore. I'm with my guest host, Rob Chaney, as always. Thanks for coming on, Rob. No problem, mate. My favourite so part of the week. Uh, do you know what? It goes so quickly, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, and it's, it's, just my, it's the most fun chatting golf every week with you and another legend we have on the show today. Yeah, I'm looking forward to today's session. Uh, we've got Zane Scotland. Thanks for joining us, Zane. Thanks for having me on. I'm following, uh, following the great Billy Irvine, aren't I? So I'm, I'm up against it this week. <laughs> so for those of you who no don't guitar, know... There's no guitars or nothing this week. I was going to say, have you got, got piano, guitar we've had? Sit, can you no, sing? I've got none of that. No, sorry, guys. No, no talent, just sorry. golf. No, nothing. So guys out there, if you don't know, Zane is um, a tour professional, former tour professional on the European tour. He's played Challenge Tour. He's played every tour, you name it. He's played in the Open twice. I believe uh, yeah. he's the youngest yep. ever player to qualify for the Open. Is that still stand? Yeah, youngest qualifier. Yeah, youngest qualifier. Quite people have been exempt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, longest qualifier. Newest sixteen. Is that right? Yeah, it's a long, long time ago. That was a long time ago. I sort of remember. <laughs> Unfortunately, like, yeah. I'm I'm a year or two younger than you, and uh, I, I remember around that time I was junior golfer myself, and uh, I remember when you qualified for the Open, and that was unbelievable, mate. So I just I yeah, was, it might, for me it was start, carried on from, it, it was, for me it was probably inspired by Justin Rose. Justin the year before had, had that great right. finish yeah. at um, Birkdale. And I think, you know, he kind of, you know, I'd, I'd known Justin through uh, England coaching and he was from Hampshire, from Surrey a little bit, you know, and, you know, he just kind of opened that door. I guess it was a bit of the, a bit of the four minute mile sort of thing. Like you, know, you see someone yeah. else do it, you think, uh, especially at that age, you don't have all the scar tissue and you just think that's what you're supposed to do. And then you just follow in the footsteps, you know, yeah. and now, now when I look back, I think quite, that was actually quite something. Oh, at mate, the time, it's an unbelievable stat really to uh, 16 at, years bit, old. At the time, at the time, a bit of naivety really, you just thinking, you just think that's life. Uh, yeah. This is what you're supposed to do. You know, having five years into start, have, having started a golf career, yeah. being on the range of the Open Championship, it's actually quite something but at the time. It was just, watched it on telly that's what you're supposed to do so you started you golf that at, back. you started golf at 11 years old is that right yeah so 11 years old I uh, my dad started at the same sort of time so we had the whole you know the whole golf bug thing and we uh, would go to the range uh, as many nights as possible chipping in the back garden every single day we would play I played nine holes before school in the summer wow um, and we would watch um, watch you know, David led better, vid better videos, the long game, short game, taken to the course yeah, over and over. If golf wasn't on the television watching, uh, there was that guy he had on who was like his, his student who was like an, apparently like a 16, 18 handicap. And he literally had duff a three wood and David would give him a quick tip. And then all of a sudden he'd like, <laughs> it was quite apparent to see he was actually probably a scratch golfer. And he'd hit this big high draw in one, in one shot. Um, now coaching, you know, it doesn't quite work like that, but yeah. One well, time. it's amazing how much has changed, right? You going back twenty years ago when we were all growing up as junior golfers, uh, you had the DVDs or sorry, the videotapes probably then mm. back in those yeah, days. Yeah, obviously we've got every everyone's on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, every social media swings. There's so much advice out there, so it's almost on the other way, isn't it? Too much. There's almost too much advice. So there's um, probably too much. It's probably too much advice, but I think that, that the info has gotten so much better i yeah. think i don't know what you guys think uh but i think i think the golfing world is as much argument as there is there's probably more agreement now um it's getting you know, that way. via yeah via like you know golf machine um mac did his thing stack and tilt 
there's yeah. much more agreement now on what is the the better ways of doing it or the yeah. closer, you know, the, the better journey to get into good golf. I think it's a lot to do with technology, right? Trackmans and GC quads and all the rest of it that measure club data. I think that's really a big part of it. I know even going back 10 years ago, the ball flight laws were, weren't, weren't agreed upon. Um, and yeah. that's obviously changed. And now, now with the technology, it's the sort of, it's something to back it up. And that's what I like about the, the stack and tilt system as being part of a network and like-minded golf coaches. There's, there's an answer to everything. And I think that's quite important. Yeah, definitely. There's no the, the the voodoo part of golf has kind of gone now, isn't it? You know, there's no yeah. waging a magic magic wand anymore. It's like if you say something, you need to be able to back it up with some sort of numbers or facts, you know. And you know, you guys probably see it. You're actually getting getting recreational golfers actually know their numbers. They know what the yeah. trackman numbers mean. They know what a D plane means. That sort of stuff. I think yeah. five years ago, if you said D plane, you know, uh, people would have been like, oh no, I don't want to hear it. Or yeah. now yeah. it's a it's a prerequisite of a 15 yeah. handicap golfer, isn't it, to understand it? Yeah, so I think that's a quite a good point. Uh, so as a junior, Zane, you obviously at six, winding back to 16 again, where were you playing golf at the time? Um, so I was playing golf at 16 years old. I was playing golf in Surrey. Uh, Woodcote Park was my golf club. Yeah. Um, we didn't we didn't have a, really have a practice ground. We had a very thin practice ground, which you went on once every two weeks with your own balls. Yeah. And then you would lose a few balls and decide I want to go out on the golf course. Um, <laughs> and literally, yeah, so I kind of grew up playing like three club challenges, uh, one club challenges in the evenings, putting comps galore, um, and surrounded by other good young players, really. Um, and yeah, and then that just kind of, yeah, I kind of got to scratch by about 15 years old. And then during that summer, wow. when I qualified for the Open at 16, I, I'd... I kind of broken through a little bit, a bit of a barrier and got into plus two. And I was, you know, golf was relatively easy, uh, you know, um, at that time. And I, I know Tiger Woods had just come onto the scene. So you just kind of copy whether he did really, you know, big wide, yeah. short swing and hit yeah. it further. And I think I, and up distance, because he was the person that brought like, brought this 300 yards uh, drive, being a normal drive into play. And so yeah. I probably found like 20 or 30 yards just because this guy, hit it further so you would go to the golf course the next day and just try and just smash drives and um yeah and that's and, and my game I went for kind of a scratch to a plus two but I had you know but off the back of having played one cup challenges and three cup challenges I had a short game and had some shot making ability yeah I think that's it kind important. of carried me through yeah yeah and you know and, and I had some good information good advice from some people to, to say go and play as many different golf courses as many competitions as you can yeah and yeah, it, it paid back. Did you, were you technical as a kid or did you just go out and play? No, I just, I just went out and play. I, I played pretty much like if I was, I would go to the, if I hit a few shots before, um, before in the morning and the ball would go left, I would go and aim right. And if I was in it to the right uh, on the yeah. range or on a few shots or early on in the round, actually, I didn't, didn't really warm up very often. Pretty much by the first two tee shots, just painted a picture of where I went for the rest of the day. That was, and that was it, really. Um, you know, just that's how just somehow found a, a way to get the ball around the golf course without thinking about about it yeah. too much. I think that's quite and a good I had point. A coach. Go on. No, I was just talking about when you said about you where you turned up on the day and it went left or went right. I think that's quite a good point. Everyone tends to have sort of a, a shot pattern and no one really should aim straight. Um, we, we did a seminar a few weeks ago on, with Golf Tech and we were talking about the shot patterns and how no real golfer aims at the target. They aim in a direction that will sort of help with their ball flight. And I think that's quite important. A lot of people could learn from that, knowing what their pattern is and and even on the day, just turning up and just aiming in a certain area. I was always going to say. Yeah, so definitely. You... Yeah, definitely. I mean, I had a coach at the time who wasn't, who was more into the mental side of things. And, I, you know, okay. I kind of, I, I stayed with him 10 years and he, and, you know, I played a lot of good golf under him, but I had no understanding of my golf swing whatsoever. I couldn't, I couldn't write, you know, you could probably write on the back of a poster stamp with a paintbrush what I knew about the golf swings. <laughs> it was all, it was all feel, you know. Um, yeah. But I guess one thing that I did have was that growing up, I would, I would draw it a lot. And yeah. then, and then if I was, and then as I went on, I kind of worked out how to hit like a bit of a aim left, aim left cut if I needed to down a tight hole and that probably that took the bad golf out because if I got to a tight hole a hole I didn't like 
because aim left and just add nudge yeah. into the fairway. Um, yeah, and then that kind of progressed really. And I went on a few years, you know, kind of getting by. Um, and I actually probably played some of my best golf, moving the ball left to right. But you know what? I didn't know how I did it. I just kind of, I would go through times when I, I would be great at moving the ball left to right. And I, I, when I think back now, now I know what I know. I would, yeah. when it was at its best, it was, it was like a bit of a push fade. But when it was off, it was like a pull fade. But that was just me just just randomly trying to manufacture the ball going left to right. And what I know, and I think what I know now is I can now move the ball right to left and left to right, but from the same same model of swing from what I've yeah. learned, you know, from being around guys like yourself and, you know, all the other uh, all the other stuff we know these days. But so, yeah, my coach then didn't know any technical stuff. You know, it was so, amazing, really. Um, did you stay with that coach for, you said, 10 years and then did you change coach or did you just go out on your own and try and figure it out? Yeah, so I kind of stayed with him for like 10 years and I was, I was mentally really good. And he, that was really his strong, his strong point was, um, uh, was the mental side of things and being super focused and, yeah. uh, and practice regimes. And the, he obviously gave, you know, gave me some, some decent direction, but you know, I honestly can't, I can't remember the technical side of things he told me. Um, and at, at the end of that 10 years, I kind of had got my tour card, but I'd kind of, my game had gone off. I played at Wentworth in the PGA and, I literally had nothing like, you know, my game was so far off and it wasn't a mental thing because I knew that, you know, I'm a good player and I've got confidence and I could shot good scores. Um, but I just had no goal swing to kind of back it up. And I really struggled uh, at a tournament, which I was hoping to do well at, you know, playing Wentworth during the PGA Championship, which I'd been and watched, you know, watched as a kid and wanted to do so well so badly. And uh, yeah, nothing. So, so when then, was this, 2007, got, 2008, when you had your card, is that right? Yeah, that would have been um, that would have been 2008, that one, yeah. that first time I played that. And uh, yeah, and then and then I actually then went down a road of just hitting loads of balls, trying to trying to find it in the dirt pretty much. Yeah. Uh, and I actually hit so many balls, I was just literally on the range that morning to night, and I ended up fracturing my wrist and putting myself out for like a year, um, which, right. you know, just just guessing at stuff really. And, um, and yeah, it was quite a bit of a tough time. And in that time, I kind of realized that I've gotten to this point now. I need to know, I need to know what makes me play well. And I don't know what it is. Yeah. And I wasn't getting the answers from my coach quick enough. Um, so yes, and that took me down the road of, you know, a couple of coaches when you, cause when you change coach, you don't always find the right person straight away. Yeah, you know, you got to gel with that person. They got to know what they they're talking about. They have got to understand you, and then you got to give them enough time. So it might be a couple of months. You know, you find you know, so it doesn't always happen that way. And I kind of I went to see a uh, a coach who was involved in the Morad stuff, which was you know completely opposite to what I'd ever uh, what I'd ever experienced. Um, and I was having a little bit of success. I was starting to hit the ball a little bit better, but it still seemed way too much for me and then um then he invited me to go on to like the McAgrady golf school yeah uh, for, like the first one I did and it was like three days and it was a bit of a mind-blowing thing really like I just I'd never seen golf in that way and and it was just everything that it was the first time I, everything that was questioned there was a some form of answer for um to which Matt gave and it was it was amazing but it was just so much information and I couldn't process it very well and it probably took me about six or seven years to get some form of small grasp on what that was all about. Because just because the information was great, but it was just kind of um, the way that it was like put together. We yeah. just it was just too all over the place for me. Um, and you know, golf became quite difficult, really. Just all of a sudden, you know, from from being a junior golfer, just seeing a sh you know, if the ball's going left, to aim right, to uh, you know. Uh, Standing over the ball, getting neck, to, you know, all these neck tilts yeah. and this sort of yeah. stuff, and P one, P two, and it was just like a bit of a mess, really. What sort of time period was that, thing? So that was that was two thousand and nine uh, that I went on the school. Um, in hindsight, being on tour as a player, I think a lot of stuff was good. But in hindsight, what I would have done was go back to the coach who I was seeing at the time and just say, "Look, I don't want to know about it." 
I just want to hit this shot shape. And yeah. um, if I'm being really brutal, I don't even want to see it. I just want to, I don't want to see my goal so much. Well, you just tell me what to do. You know, during, probably during that time and processed and done it over a long time. Um, but, you know, hindsight is a beautiful thing, isn't it? And we, yeah. As a and golfers, as golfers, we don't make very good decisions, do we? So we want it all, all now, and you know I'm not immune to that. Yeah. Uh, so, so you, after you, you did the more ad uh, Mac stuff, you you went on to the Challenge Tour or the Mina Tour, is that right? Yeah. So I was kind of in that time. I'd had um, uh, uh, change in the family situation, like we had a baby. You know, that was kind of a tough year or two, you know, to kind of get used to all that sort of stuff. Um, and I struggled with a bit of injury. Um, and I was playing a little bit of um, a kind of off the back of my original injury, where I fractured my wrist. I came back and didn't didn't retain a full card off my medical. So I played a little bit of the main tour, then a bit of challenge tour. It's dipping in and out, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, then the Mina tour came around. And, you know, I enjoyed playing in the Middle East because I'd had injuries. I'd had back injury and neck injury. And being in the heat really helped me. And yeah, I kind of got a bit of love back for the game again, probably from the back of winning tournaments. Yeah, when you're playing well, you love the game. Don't you? So yeah, I started to win some tournaments. And that kind of gave me a bit of a second win with it, really, which was great. Um, but then the back injury kind of got a little bit worse uh, around 2015, 2016. Um, again, really, you know, just not really understanding stuff. Like the stuff I understand now, I just look back at what I was doing or working on. I just think, oh, yeah. what was I? What was I thinking? Um, but you know, you know that you know, it's life and it's golfing life. And yeah, and then that kind of, and then being on the Mina tour, I was obviously around some more players. And I was, you know, I was one of the first guys to go out of the tripod uh, at at one of these smaller uh, Mina tour events and be filming my swing and working on stuff. And then I was starting to play well. So then inevitably, everyone started doing that. Players around you are like, oh, what's what are you looking at there? So you tell them, and they're like, oh, can you have a look at my swing? And what do you see? And then that kind of happened. Um, and then there was one young lad uh, who who was amateur golfer, 19, 20 years old, and had a, quite a nice move. And that happened on the range. He's like, oh, can you, do you mind, have, you know, do you mind have a look at my swing? So I put it on camera. And he goes, oh, what do you think? I was like, oh, I think it's really good. Because I'm, I'm hitting it right. What Would you do this and this? And I was like, no, nah, no chance. That's like, last thing I would do, that's probably the best part of your swing. I wouldn't change that bit. I'd do this. And he went out and he played quite well. And then he started to like climb up the world ranking, the amateur world rankings. Um, over about over about five or six weeks, he kind of went from yeah. like, I think 1400 up to like top 400 in the world. Um, yeah. And then when we came home after that stint in the Middle East, uh, we went out and played golf. And when we were playing, he said, look, I was wondering, well, would you be my, would you be my like proper coach? And I was thinking, oh, like, I was supposed to start coaching in about another 10, 15 years. So I wasn't, wasn't really supposed to do it now. And um, I said, yeah, I'll do it. And, it. and interestingly enough, the coach that he had worked with, had, he was hitting the ball to the right and yeah. uh, the co- and at that time. And he has like a really stable club face. So like he exits really left really easily with a stable club face. Yeah. But he just got a bit under now and again. And, um, and, the, co- and the coach that he was working at the time said, just told him just to feel like you roll your hands a bit. And I was yeah. just like... Are you joking? Like, you know, well, he got this great move and to get, stop it going right, just roll your hands. It's like, what is this, like 1983 or something? I like watched him <laughs> Caddyshack. Um, yeah, so just, you know, you know, just starting to put in a bit of the, a bit of the system that, you know, we use now. Yeah. Of like, okay, you know, let's get it. The arms are a bit up on the way back, a bit high. So you're having to like, you know, right side bend and pull down, get this bit stuck under before you turn. So you hit the shots high to the right. So how about, how about we feel like we swing in a bit more on the way back? And he's like, what do you mean? But I'm in it right, you know, swing yeah. in a bit more on the way back, lower the arms, keep arm, on you know, the grid. pressure under the armpits, stay on the grid, and then turn onto it. Boom, like, you know, just, just hitting these balls like, you know, two yard draws, like the holy grail of golf, really. So your but, first yeah, student was, that. your first student was like one of the best amateurs in the world, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And he, he ended up, he kind of saw and ended up getting in, he got to about number eight in the world m to rankings just before wow. he turned pro sort of thing but you know what it's it's good and bad isn't it because on one hand he's already a good golfer so he just yeah. needs tweaking uh but on the other hand he's one of the hardest he's got a fantastic golf spin one of the other parts is 
he's one of the hardest people to work with because he just wanted to hit it like dead straight. And it, we'll go out and we'll watch him hit shots, you know, and I'm a, you know, I've been a decent player and they'll be hitting shots and I'll be thinking, that's really good that, you know, every ball, like 10, literally not hitting the outside 15 feet. And then after about 10, 12 shots, yeah, but they're all going left. I'm like, yeah, but they're all going 12 feet left from 190 yards, like it's nothing, but he has to hit it. But it's always like, how, what, what way do you want to hit it? Because oh, I want to hit it straight. And you're just like, ah, oh. <laughs> like, why do you have to pick the hard one? <laughs> <laughs> so do you use Trapman or what, what would you use in at that time? Um, so I started off using Trackman. Uh, when I was uh, when I was playing, I had a Trackman and used it all in the wrong way. You know, just looked at club data all the time. Didn't really yeah. know what I was looking at. Um, didn't understand swing direction and how that then related to the grid and shot shape. Um, and then I sold it. And then I bought another one when I started coaching and didn't use the club data at all. Just used it all for tests and uh, ball data and how far the ball's going. And then now I use the quad, um, which I think is a really good coaching tool because the club data is so accurate. Um, we still use a track man a little bit, but the quad's been the main one. Just for the club data, I think the quad gives you the best numbers. Uh, yeah, so I've done a, I've done a little testing goal, on the that. Goal clubs. I think obviously uh -huh. when you when you can see the face with the quad, I think that makes a big difference. The strike location, the line goal, yeah. and stuff like that. I think, yeah, the quad, we use quad, but we're indoors. I, I guess it's different. I know since working outdoors in the past, Trapman's obviously great with the radar, mm. but I think the quad is indoor for when where we me and, when we put the two up against each other. I don't know if you found this. Like, what the only thing I noticed was that um, when a lot of numbers are similar, but when there's a miss hit, the quad seemed to still register similar numbers that had been registering up to that point. Yeah. And the track man, the, the club numbers would go way out. Or yeah. Whatever. That's what, that was the main difference I noticed. Yeah, I've only done one it. test on this and this was indoors and uh, I found exactly the same thing, but it was indoors. So it's right. probably the best, best way to uh, test yeah. it. Um, mm. no, I, think the, I think the quad is absolutely awesome. So yeah, um, at the moment, Zane, so you're, um, that was sort of your journey into coaching, right? You, you started working with yes. an amateur golfer. Uh, how did you get into stack and tilt? Um, so, yeah. So obviously for me, it, it started, my journey started with getting into the golf, finding out about the golf swing via uh, the Morad system. And then, you know, then that, and then it obviously became quite apparent that there was this like, magic yellow book called the golfing machine, which I uh, picked up and then put down quite quickly. Um, and I thought, okay, that was the first time I thought, okay, there's a lot to this. I mean, we yeah. sat down, we sat down with Mac at the first school and he had a picture of a, uh, it was a face on P1 setup. And he said, okay, and we're looking at it. He goes, what do you see? And, you know, you're thinking, I'm not too sure really. He's got, oh, there's 21 different points of interest I'm seeing here. I'm like, what? Okay. So you work through all that and that takes yeah. about two hours. And then he's like, right, then he flips the, down the line, P1. And now he's like, like, there's 19 different points of interest here. And I'm like, I'm just looking at where he's lined up and, you know, where his shoulders are, you know. So yeah. that was, and, but, but that, that got my brain thinking, okay, there's a system to this, like how he's doing it, even though it was a complete mess. Um, what well, felt like a mess to me. Um, and then, yeah, and then I guess once you into that world, you kind of understand actually there's actually a lot of people who work this way and there is actually a system it's not all just about rhythm and you know low and slow and yeah. um and then yeah as and then you obviously hear i'd originally heard about stack and tilt and um you know kind of disregarded it quite quickly you know because obviously cause there was a, a bit of uh probably misunderstanding which yeah. which we've probably all experienced at some point from people that haven't been on any network training or, or met Andy. Um, and then it kind of came back. I met Billy, Billy Irvin, uh, at the Service and Golf Studio. One well, of my friends, he owned it. Billy was a super nice guy. We, from chatting with, was having conversations with him. We were just talking. It was one of the first time I kind of found someone who was, um, kind of, we're just talking in a similar sort of language, same as some of the terminology. Yeah. Talking about the golf swing. I was thinking, we're agreeing a lot here. Like that's not supposed to happen. Normally, you know, you get into arguments about golf swings. Yeah. It's like, okay, these, these things are really close. So we just spent a bit of time together. Um, I would hit shots and he would talk about things and I'd be like, I would like what he said. Um, and I was like, yeah, these things are really similar here. And then 
I'd come across also on social media, come across Andreas Kelly. And I was chatting to Andreas a little bit because I, I kind of knew him a little bit from growing up and he played a bit of challenge tour. And you look at all his stuff and his youngsters are all swing it like unbelievable. Awesome. Um, it's got a swing to die for, haven't they? Yeah. Uh, makes you yeah. very jealous. Um, and yeah, I was just chatting to him about thing, things and he was like super. And I was, again, it was like, we're talking about similar sort of things here. We we're agreeing on a lot of things. And also he knew some extra stuff. And I was like, that's interesting. And he said, look, there's a, there's a network training coming up in, in Sweden. Uh, I'd missed one in London. He said, look, there's a network training coming up in Sweden, like I think in a week's time or something like that. Uh, and he's coming over. You should come. And I was just like, I was literally like, I just booked it straight away. Like I was like, I can't, I can't not do this. So um, yeah. yeah, literally booked it, got the early flight to Sweden, rented the car, drove for like a couple of hours, had a, had a flight booked back that evening, went to a room, wow. you know, full of, for the people I didn't didn't know who they were, I knew Andreas, um, didn't yeah. know anybody else. Um, some quite mean looking characters, but when you get to know them, uh, they're very nice people. Did you meet TK? Um, met TK, exactly what yeah. I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I thought he so. super, super nice guy, and uh, and I guess and and uh, I don't know if Andy was aware, he was some sort of aware I was coming, and I was quite quite like uh, taken aback. He was just super nice, you know. He like, yeah. welcomed me you know, made a point to come and say hi and thanks for being there and so forth. And um, yeah, and then he obviously set on his, uh, set on about his uh, way of delivering the system and talking about how it came to the fore. And and um, yeah, I was just super impressed by the way that it was all laid out. Um, and it was uh, how it was, he, he made it so usable and how there was a, a step-by-step process to how, how you start to lay things out and start to see the golf swing and how you measure the golf swing, and 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 what probably what really stood out was, yes, there's like a there's like a, like a model, like a, like okay, this is where we start to measure it from. Yeah. But it was like you didn't have to like, you didn't have to be, you didn't have to go all in on everything. It was like, it was just like, hey, this is how we're gonna, this is how we're gonna see the model. This is the golfer. And then what pieces can we put in? And it might only be one small piece to make their life a little bit easier um and i was like okay i like this and i think when he went through the the, the fundamentals that was that was one thing that really got me was like okay was like you know strike like curve and i was like thinking yeah that makes okay yeah this is starting to make sense now like can i hit it far enough can i curve it can yeah. i control the curve and can i strike it okay that makes sense and then you because all these things to do with like uh, question, probably, quite, probably question I had in my head about you know set up, you know, you know the old grass like grip alignment, yeah. you know start to posture that sort of stuff. And then I was like thinking, yeah, but they were, I think intuitively you know that they're all over the place, don't you? you know that yeah. everyone grips it differently, or you, I, I'd experienced players that gripped it so differently, you know, away from what would be like conventional, or you know, I played with. Um, like someone like Thomas Aiken, who would aim miles, miles left. I played with him, he shot 67 at London Club, but he would aim like 50 yards left and hit this big high slice thing. I think, yeah, but if he went to a PJ professional uh, and was yeah. taken from that book, he would. they would change everything in his golf swing. But this guy's out there making loads of money and he's, you know, beating me. Like, that makes sense. <laughs> so when, um, when Andy kind of explained those, I was like, okay, yeah, that makes sense that. This is like... This is actually putting things in place, which I would think I'm going to things you can use. And if you things we spoke about today or on that day, I just kind of got the feeling we're going to have the same conversation in five, 10 years time. And he's going to give me very, very similar answers. Like, these, yeah. you know, it's going to be refined and gotten better, but it's just not just making stuff up this. Um, yeah. I think talking. Yeah, it was, it was really I've good. Been, I've been fortunate to, attend a number of Andy's presentations and I, I know Rob has attended a lot more than I have and he, it has evolved definitely he's over the time but generally the general message is always the same but certainly he does add bits in and uh, it, it does evolve um I, would you agree Rob definitely yeah I was sort of sitting there listening to Zane I was sort of like mesmerized yeah. by his conversation because it's I'm nodding my head and I'm like yeah yeah I did a I did a podcast this week with a guy in Australia called Jake Colleen and uh, he asked me all about stack and tilt and I I'm hearing myself when Zane's answering those questions like the, I had the 
I had my epiphany with James Ridyard where he's in the bay with me at Bedford and he's like, here's, here's the fundamentals. I'm like, oh my God, that's like, that makes so much sense. I mean, why, why would you not measure a golfer based on those, those dynamic fundamentals? <clears throat> why would you ever think about telling someone to have a perfect grip, whatever that might be? And it just made so much sense. So yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to Zane's story and I think we've probably got similar stories as, as golfers and as, as instructors, our system that we had that we were using just wasn't good enough and then when you meet Andy it's like oh my god this guy understands this thing inside out back to front and it's just it's so uh eye-opening when you when you hear it from someone who's so uh, well versed and has it has it so well organized in his head and understands how all these things fit together um so I couldn't couldn't agree more I mean Attending network training is a minimum prerequisite for any golf instructor. Even if you only manage to get to one, right, you've got to go and spend a day with Andy Plummer. If you've not done it, you are missing out in a, in a big way. Yeah, I totally agree, Rob. I couldn't have said that better myself. <laughs> definitely, definitely. I mean, I've seen, like, I've seen uh, and spent time with lo lots and lots of coaches. And for me, um, in terms of like, the, whole, the whole kind of package, in terms of knowledge and how to deliver it and deliver it in, in different in the same stuff in very different ways um and educate all at the same time like he's by far by far and away the best there's other coaches who can don't get me wrong there's other coaches who i've worked with who they just know how to get you to play well tomorrow yeah but then the education part may be lacking but they get you to do something to make you feel better about yourself to make you hit better shots I get that, but then it doesn't necessarily last. You almost need that guy next to you the whole time. Uh, but you know, but at the time that that fits, that, that you know, that, that does tick a box. But what I find, I think you know, you work with a lot of really, really good players now, Zane, and I think your understanding of the grid now would allow you to do that lesson as well, wouldn't it? On the night before a tournament, if someone starts overdrawing the ball, you're not going to start changing their golf swing the night before a tournament. You're just going to make an adjustment on the grid at P1. And they're going to be good to go. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that I think that I think that also probably resonated with me as a player was that um, was having that piece, uh, understanding the grid was has been a bit of a revelation, really. I think I can't. You, I think you kind of intuitively know it, but uh, when you the more and more you understand it, the the more you can start to measure what you're doing, and also you can change your. You can change your own golf. You can change your own ball flight very quickly, and coaching with players, as you say, yes, like you're not going to make. I'm not going to make a swing change to a player. It's not possible to make and have a new swing tomorrow morning, but you can have a new setup, which can give you a new, a different shape of ball flight. Yeah, and that's one thing you can implement straight away, and you need to know that straight away. And I think that's what that was another part I kind of got from Andy was like you had this guy who could. Um, do with these like, amazing drawings uh, and you know talk about degrees and numbers and all these you know all these educational parts that you probably have to you know have to go and study to make sure you know and the other part of it was that that you know that he would on the night before the first round of the tournament he'd also be a great guy to go to because he could give you something to do on the grid to make you change your ball flight like tomorrow which I always found like with some other instructor you think they know they really know their stuff but god I, would, I wouldn't want that guy on a wednesday night like i need <laughs> you know uh, I, I don't i'm not sure he's going to go speak to but just like that's what like really impressed me was like okay and then he was also able to he could do it and then he could also teach me how to start looking at the grid use the grid for the outcome that i wanted for that i want for the player that i'm working with and and then also I think the grids are really good. A really good point, actually, when um, working with the good players and and poor players. But sometimes some some good players have such good golf swings, and you and you get so used to watching them, you're thinking it's, it's hard to see much wrong here when someone's got such a good golf swing. But then when you start to like in your mind's eye see the grid, you can actually start to see that like, mm, that's that's the small piece where he's getting off. We can just put that back there. Obviously, with some some players who have like a really funky swing, like it's very easy to see that straight away, isn't it? It's very easy to see like, yeah, the guy's taking his arms up or whatever it is. But the, the the grid has really come into play for me to be able to look at a golf swing of good players and notice 
okay, actually, if we're talking about really this this player is like has has a really conventional move, and actually working as close to grid as possible yeah. is going to is 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 his best way of like longevity. And so you can actually you can see when they start to drift off a little bit, and without so, that, I think it would be really hard. I think you just I, I would actually be trying to find new pieces all the time. With yeah. um, the players you work with, Zane, do you? Do you have a grid set out or do you explain it to them or how would you go about it in a coaching environment? Yeah, I guess, weird enough, I guess my own my own like, coaching system, uh, which has probably come from, you know, been around Andy, is like when I do work, start working with a new good player, in the first session, I just I actually now just find myself going, look, um, explaining the grid, putting the sticks out, how I understand it, you know, cause, and I, I normally use a line which I completely... Uh, believe in it's true it's like if someone had taught me this when I was 14 years old I wouldn't have hit half as many balls and I wouldn't have seen half as many coaches as I was at, that I've seen so yeah and so I'll it's almost a, it's a prerequisite of anyone that I work with I have to have some understanding of the grid not yeah. necessarily to swing it perfectly on the grid but to know how to measure their own goal swing against it to know if they're doing something not enough or too much if that makes sense and and if they and they, they may hit like a swooping draw or they may hit like a you know a fifteen yard cut, but to know how that looks on the grid to make sure they they can do they can repeat that. Otherwise, your your setup can change all the time, which essentially ends up changing your whole goal swing. So yeah, yeah using the grid is a bit of a prerequisite now to, to um, any player I work with. But you know what I find, even guys that I've worked with for a long time, still have to re, they still want to. And to re-explain things to them, and you know when uh, you guys probably get it, you just look at the grid, and, you, and that's golf. You know, if you send over a <laughs> shot, you can like almost see the grid. And that's yeah. how it works. And sometimes you forget that not everybody just just knows the stuff that you know in your head. Yeah. Even good players, and you have to cut, keep repeating it to them. You know, that was a good point about the grid. Um, I asked Mike Bennett, I caddied for him a few years ago, and I asked him what he, what did he see when he set up to the golf ball, and he said that. Mm. He didn't see the grass. He saw a grid, and that's what you could see. He could sit up to the ball. Right. And he thought you saw that grid on that ball. He didn't really look at the target. He just kind of set up in his mind where he was in relationship yeah. to the target with on the grid, and, and that's what he used to. That's what he used to see. And I think that's quite important. We at Golf Tech we set up a grid in every bay. We have them drawn out in pen or in T claws and draw out yeah. the grid and we get people to practice with it as well. I think the more times you, you see it subconsciously or consciously it's there and you can follow those lines. And I think it's amazing really the amount mm. of people we've taught that just are, are blown away by it really once they see it for the first time, even like you say, good players as well. It's just, it's just never been yeah. explained to them in that way, which is, uh, which is great. The way Andy. It really it, hasn't. It really hasn't. The amount, the amount of good players that come in, they had no clue how it works yeah. and now I'm like when they come in I'm a little bit like oh, come on mate you should you should know this but then well, if I'm being honest I think well 10 years ago I didn't know that either yeah. but when they come in I'm just like how can you not know this but you know like it's cause it's so important I, I tend to use like the orange sticks so then I'll just say to like people like that we'll put the orange sticks out so when you get on the golf course when you can be able to see this orange all the orange sticks where yeah. they are you know yeah mm -hmm. And use those bits, but yeah, it is amazing. Andy, Andy, Andy talks about in the you know having the sticks almost you know the out of the ground sticks for the hand path, and how you know, yeah. just visualize that in his mind as he was practicing for many years because that was his biggest problem was his arms sort of lifting. Yeah. Um, and it was like I just need to walk around with those sticks in my head. <laughs> they're they're always yeah. there. <laughs> like yeah. I can't lift yeah. my arms. I have to keep them under. Um, so. Uh, there's actually an interesting question just popped up there from Megan. I'll, I'll grab it because it's talking about the grid. How come okay. the grid is not mentioned in the Stack and Tilt book? Is there a website? Um, I know, I do know that there is a new book being worked on and I know it's being all about the grid. So it's coming. Okay. I know for sure that's being worked on. Um, I think it's mentioned in the book. I'm sure it is. I'm, I think there's a little bit in there. Yeah, but um, not, not to the detail where we've drawn out the lines. Um, yeah. There's... Certainly, there's a picture in there, I think, of Mike with a driver and there's some paint on the ground and sort of, yeah. there's a little reference to it, but yeah, it's not in, it's not in a sort of massive sort of detail. So, um, Zane, is there any tour players you work with at the moment? So, um, I reckon we, we've probably got, I was trying to count it the other day, probably between 15 and 20 pros, all at some level from elite amateur uh, trying to make it. We had one guy like that last year, went from kind of challenge tour 
struggling a little bit to actually get his card, which was like, which was fun to go through that journey. Um, uh, and yeah, the, I guess the next stage really is, for me, it's always been about like going on the journey of have someone to get there. I've never yeah. really been, never really been that driven by like trying to just go out on tour and try and pick up a player. Because I think you know what, you know, it's almost quite, it's almost easy to do that because uh, the guys on the tour are. Um, they're all looking for something new or something yeah. little secret. And if there's someone just has to be standing around and can you have a look, you'd be amazed at what what some some top players they'll listen to anything and um, yeah. without questioning it. And you and um, it's quite surprising. Uh, maybe uh, I don't think I really did it too much. Um, I didn't really drift around, but you'd be quite. It's actually quite shocking, really. And it's almost it's too easy a job to just go and stand at the back of the range and someone asks you a question and away you go. I would, my whole goal is to like really is to take some young players yeah. and take them right through that process of getting them to the tour and awesome. educate them and so that when they're out there, you know, they can they can be struggling with their own game a little bit and then put the grid out and go, like, I'm going to try and find a shot for tomorrow, you know, and not be on complete panic stations. Um, yeah. and, and when they're playing well, know exactly why they're playing well. And, you know, and uh, one, one thing I think is quite interesting was um, some, a lot of, quite a few coaches have kind of said about, you know, a lot of guys hitting this fade now on tour, uh, moving the ball left to right, the good players move it left to right. But actually, you know what? I think, I think now, there, I think there's more players that move it right to left now via better understanding of the golf swing um, than there has been for a long time. I don't think, um, there are, there's always going to be people who fade it and draw it. But I think, yeah. I think where coaching's getting better uh, via all these outlets and I think, you know, um, that that have really come into the fore now, uh, and understanding the bullfight laws and that sort of stuff. I think there's more drawers now than ever before. Well, the draws built in, as we all exactly, know. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I think I didn't know I didn't know how to build in the draw before, so my yeah. draw became like a big block, a big high block cut, or quick low left. <laughs> um, but you know, now I know how to build in the draw. It's you know, it just makes a bit more sense. Yeah, so I think a lot of good different, players... Different probably... way to how... Different to how I was taught to draw the ball. I remember that much. We're yeah. about the same age, Zane. I think you're a couple of years younger than me, maybe. But mm. I think we were taught... Yeah, I grew up in the same age, the same era as you with Faldo's Nick, and um, uh, the Ledbetter stuff was coming on the scene when I was a young golfer watching all those videos that you were talking about. And, and drawing the golf ball back then was, you know, rolling the wrists through impact and... Uh, yeah, yeah that's twisting and rolling yeah, you to, to impact. You had to move off it, didn't you? You had to move off yep. it and then... And then you had to roll your wrists. Yeah. That's you how stay, that. stay on your back foot and roll the hands. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Different now. It's very... So, yeah. Yeah, so different. Whereas now, actually, you know, if someone wants to draw it, I would actually say, well, okay, you got to make sure, make sure you, you stay... You stay on it and you stay left to draw it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think you know, it's... A... You know... That's uh yeah that 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 is one thing I would never have done uh ten fifteen years ago, hundred percent would have gone to the right to do it yeah. you know it's, it's yeah. mad, mental going going back to the book I think the first sentence in the book or the first paragraph mentions that if every golf um, book or instruction was to put your weight on the left, um and keep your weight forward and swing your hands in we would have a lot of golfers that draw the golf ball whereas. Mm-hmm. history tells us and from our experience that the majority of people that we work with the higher handicappers anyway are tend to be tend to be slicers because they've shifted to the right and they're swiping across it to try and make contact yeah. with the ball so i think that that's that hopefully will change one day you know if most golfers start keeping their weight on the left i think that will make a big difference yeah i think i think that you know from, from my understanding would be that you can you can you can kind of stay to the left but when I add, but when you turn, you can still feel like you're pressing into your right foot, but it doesn't necessarily mean you go over here. You can, yeah, you can, you can, you can turn, you can turn, stay, stay right on it. Yeah. But then you can still feel like you're pressing into. You, you can feel the top of your back swing. You can still feel like you're pressing into your right. That's that's two different things. Essentially, yeah. yes, you want to get back onto your left foot very quickly. You can also hit shots where you do reach on your left foot. That's the other part to it. But I think that that for me was. Uh, Probably what I didn't understand at the beginning was that, like, yes, you can you can turn, 
and you can feel some pressure into your right foot, but that's different to like over here and over here. You know, I can turn, yeah. be able, keep everything left, have, but still, you know, I'm still touching the ground with my right foot. You know, yeah. Once I understood it's that, that really, really, really helped. I think what's evolved as well, if you watch the coaching business that we're in, you watch the language how it's changed over the years. You know, five years ago you wouldn't have heard many people or maybe five, six years ago, you wouldn't hear many people talk about centered golf swings. Whereas nowadays, I think it's almost like that's the standard that most golf teachers are teaching. And then they'll say, but there's a pressure shift to the right now on the backswing. Mm. Whereas 10, 10 years ago, it was no, you know, you have to shift to the right and then you shift back to the left. So it's yeah. evolving all the time. Like everyone is comfortable describing a backswing as centered now. And, and there's very few coaches who would, stray away from that as being what they would prefer in their system whatever that happens to be and i think that's interesting because it never used to be like that and and now with the yeah. pressure shift yeah. conversation there's this recentering whatever that is right where they kind of the pressure shifts to the right on the backswing and then it recenters at p4 and then it's moving forward i mean yeah i think the, the the language that so many people are trying to use to circumnavigate the fact that they have to agree with 95% of what Andy and Mike wrote about more than 10 years ago, I think is, yeah. is kind of interesting and funny to watch from the, from the sidelines, you know. I totally agree. On, on that point, Zane, when you're working with uh, good players or tour players, um, do they get put off if you mention stack and tilt, if they find out about that or you, they start asking you questions? Or has that happened where? Yeah, I mean, I think like at the beginning, there was always like a little bit of like, you know, everyone's a bit like, oh, we you know, uh, stack and tilt, that doesn't work. But to me, like, um, to me, like, stack and tilt, stack and tilt isn't, isn't a swing. It's like, it's a system. And yeah. it actually agrees with loads of stuff that I've been through. And if I, and what is what I find really odd is that if you, you know, having been on, on the Morag Golf Schools and also been, uh, you know, meeting Andy and being a network trainer. Now, essentially, essentially, they're the same thing. Like, uh, you talk all, all the same language. It's the same model of golf swing. Yeah, it seems to be, with the Morad McGrady stuff, it's like a, some sort of secret, secret society has got all the secrets yeah. and everyone wants to be associated with it. And where a second tilt, all oh, that doesn't really work. But you know what? It's the same, it's the same stuff. Like, yeah. like Andy, Andy obviously know, will, one, another thing that I thought was great when I went to network training was Andy was very complimentary of Mac and said about how much he, um, very gracious about it and how much he learned from him and that sort of stuff. You know, and he kind of evolved a different way of uh, delivering it. So yeah, it's interesting you say like if you said to if you said to a player, uh, you know, re-sign your left, they go, oh yeah, but that's stack and tilt. And you say to a player, it would stay centered. Yeah. Go, okay, yeah, I'll do that. You're like, it's the same thing. Like, I mean, the way I I, I try and like, I do try and like mix in some of like the the first coach that I used, who was very on the mental side of things. I try and mix in a bit of what I got from him, and then a little bit when I've uh, when I've been to some of the techniques, not necessarily technical techniques, but the way of delivering information and getting people to play well that I would have got from like, say like from uh, a little bit from like, say so like Claude Harmon, for instance. So I feel like yeah. I, and then, you know, learned bits from, bits from Mac and I've, you know, more recently I've gotten a lot from the way Andy delivers his stuff and uh, what I've learned from that. And I try, I try to bring it all, you know, try to, I like to think that I bring all of it, uh, all of it together all the time, but, yeah, it's, it is really interesting how I find it really interesting that if you um, that if you say one use one term and yeah. then use another term, how some uh, the first term people are like, oh no, I don't want to do that, and then use the other term, they're like, oh, okay, I'm happy with that, and yeah. you're looking at going, it's exactly the same thing. So we're just going to have a good, quick look at. A good um, shot, doesn't matter. Can I have a quick look at your um, your swing here? Can you see this, guys? Mm -hmm. yeah i can see it yeah so i've got every, everyone's swing up here hopefully you can hear the sound as well that sounded pretty good here we go no sound nick i can't hear it but oh, there's no sound oh, it sounded good it did sound good so um i thought we'd just have a look at your your swing zone so how has it changed over the years all right well recent so, years or... um I would say the first thing, the biggest thing probably is my arms are a lot lower. Yeah. Trying to exit lower than ever I used to. Um, Trying not to get the, the arms raised above the shoulder plane. That's, you know, they, they will get off 
and I would always work on getting the arms down. Really, that was that's the main. That was probably the biggest part. Stand on um, the grid. Yep, yeah, stand on the grid. Uh, I my tendency would be to like to for the right arm to pass the left um, post impact, so seven to kind of nine. Yeah. So I'm forever trying to like not let the 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 forearms roll over. Uh, so I almost feel like when I on the downswing, I almost feel like I'm holding the steering wheel and I'm turning the steering wheel to the right on the downswing. Um, which is you know a bit counterintuitive because I always feel like I want to turn that steering wheel to the left on the downswing. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, what uh, I mean, I could talk all day. Uh, you know. It's, there's probably about 13 different things in my goal swimming that I don't like. Or, yeah. Always working on like all of us. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly understand the grid, getting the ball further, a little bit further back to make sure, because there have been times I've hit the ball a bit clean. Ball, I get the ball towards my left, uh, in line my left shoulder a lot, my irons. Yeah. The ball goes up, up in the air, um, and I pull the ball. So I, I tend to I try and really go, okay, get the ball, two balls back get more more of a compressed ball turf strike, start the ball further to the right. Um and then and then the I guess the other part which really came from um which an understanding from Andy is how, how the arms move around around the body. Um and getting the like the right humerus to, to kind of or the elbow to work around the rib cage rather than off the rib cage. Yeah. I would say that my, my right elbow comes off the rib cage as I go back and I would get across the line at the top sometimes. So um, growing up, we were, you know, we were always told to keep, keep your right elbow in and for the right elbow being pinned to the front of the body yeah, is very different to letting the right elbow move, stay close to the body, but move around the body. Yeah, um, And that's yeah. been a bit of a revelation for me to get the club on line at the top while still getting some sort of length to the backswing and not feeling pinched and narrow and no power. So this um, shot here, did it draw? Yes. Yeah, so that was, that was, uh, I was, I, I, so I filmed that last week and, um, you know, we, I was working on, I was working on that thing we're talking about, about the right arm staying lower, yeah. working around the body. And I hit a really tight, like, like three yard draw, just, I ripped it, it's five iron. It was like really pure. And I was just walking back to the camera thinking I really hope that looks good <laughs> because sometimes you know you hit a, you hit a shot sometimes you, yeah. it's a great shot you go back to the camera you go no nah, but it doesn't look this. I didn't get it right it's still not 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 where I wanted to see it and I was just walking back to the camera thinking please let that be the one if that's not the one I don't know where it is um, and it was good that's <laughs> was awesome good. It, it looks good to be practicing on grass as well yeah, um, I'm quite jealous uh, of that the dream it that swing of yours in the middle dream. there, Nick. That swing of yours in the middle there, Nick, was just, that's some of the best ball striking I've ever seen. Yeah, this was that's um, definitely valid. Draws, that, that is Mr. Tight, tight Draw, right? Look at that exit. Yeah, yeah that was, um, that would have been November 18, I think. Yeah. And I think you, did you take this video? I think you took this video. I think I, think Andy, I did. I think I did. Yeah. I think I Andy did. was sitting in the buggy with you. And yeah. Uh, yeah. That was quite nerve wracking with Andy watching you play a few holes, but uh, really, yeah, yeah, that was it. Was, I was very, uh, I was quite nervous actually with Andy watching. <laughs> you, almost want, you almost don't want to let him down, you know. Um, he, he was pretty impressed. He's had the draw. I, to, he's draw. I seem to remember like him line. saying it was like it was like a laser show. He said it's laser. a freaking laser show. I think he laser said. show. And there's a. Uh, this is Rob here. This is. Um, this was when I, when I look at my. Months ago, when I look, when I look at my setup, I realise how, how tall I am. <laughs> I bent over the ball. Well, I think you were hitting maybe an eight or a nine iron here. So yeah, sure I am. Yeah. Do, do you recognise the hole? Is that the something like number eleven or twelve at Marina Bay? Eleven. Yeah, yeah, it's eleven at Marina Bay. Yeah. Have you ever played night golf? Then? Yeah, I played a few times in Dubai. It freaks me out a little bit because you get you get four different shadows. <laughs> a bit strange, isn't it? Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it actually because you you get to see the the ball like in the background, yeah. especially on the video. We did a whole video on this actually. It was quite good to just see the ball flight afterwards. But um, the ball shots are really good. The putting is quite tricky, I find. Yeah, but the uh, the ball flight looks great, doesn't it, on the background? Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. So um, it'd be interesting to see Zane uh, 
have you got any players like playing any tournaments coming up? Or obviously, I know there's not much golf being played in the UK at the moment. Yeah, but... well, we're waiting to see because there's um, the European Tour doing this run of six events now um, in the UK. So we're kind of waiting to see, you know, how how far out that extends and that sort of stuff. So it'll be a couple of grads on that, um, and then weird enough, like the the kind of the the one day two day tour uh, around the UK now is now full of really good players um, uh, and, and you know tour players. So they're, they're becoming like they're becoming quite big time now, which is kind of odd um, yeah. that everyone's getting so pumped up about a one day tournament coming up at like one of the local courses. And you're looking down the list and you go, "God, there's all the tour players in there." So I'm actually playing one on Tuesday, uh, playing one on Thursday. So I've uh, I've probably been I've, I've hit balls a couple of times, probably a little bit more than I would do, just to try and get ready to compete against some decent players again. Where's that being played? Uh, at Woodcote Park, which is my club where I where I grew up at. So I haven't really got any excuses either. I'm really um, I'm really hoping the weather's a little bit dodgy because it gets quite tricky. So <laughs> I hope we blow a few of the good good ball strikers out of the water. So have you got to carry your own bag. Uh, I haven't said that. I mean, I'm pro- I probably will do that, but it's it's gotten a bit more relaxed now. Um, they haven't said no caddies, but um, yeah, the whole situation. I think because you're allowed to spend time with uh, more a uh, bigger group of people now, it's a bit yeah. more, as long as you're sensible, it's a bit more relaxed. Um, no spectators, is that right? No spectators, as far as I understand. I probably need to read up about the caddies. I mean, nobody wants to come caddy for me, so it wasn't really a thing I looked into. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Nick, sure Nick, do you want to, Nick, do you want to uh, tackle any of the questions? Because I'm oh, conscious my God, of I've the time. I completely forgot. Yeah, I've oh got them here. I've got them here. <clears throat> the first one that was asked earlier on, Go on by Andrew Roberts is just asking three of us our favourite current tour swing. So, Zane, I'll let you go first if you want to tell us who your favourite tour- swing on tour is. Tommy Fleetwood. I think go, he's the coast on grid, isn't he? He's very good. I've said him in the past. I'll go with Rory. Rory's swing. Uh, I would totally agree with both of you. I'll go Rose probably last year or the year before. Okay. Uh, but, someone's asking Scotty King there, Nick. You see that one? Are you on the chat now? You've got How do you align your shot? My miss is right of the target. I normally stand behind the board and align my shot with the shaft of the said, of said club and pick a spot in front of the ball. Um, yeah, so um, in terms of um, answering that question, Scotty. I think Zane talked earlier on about how he would go out and step onto the uh, the practice area or onto the course, and if he's missing in a certain direction, he would allow for that. So certainly, it, it could be something in your technique. But the first thing I would do is probably just allow for that shot. If you're if you're consistently missing a little bit to the right, then trying to try and allow for that a little bit. Uh, in terms of how I line up, I certainly I stand behind the ball. I do exactly like that and sort of pick a a starting line for the ball. How about yourself saying, how do you line up when you're out on the course? Yeah, I tend to, um, I would use an intermediate target. Um, so yeah. like three, four feet ahead of the ball to, to kind of calibrate myself to that. I don't have many shots. I would aim straight at the target, I suppose. Um, if I'm moving left to right, I would certainly aim quite a bit to the left. And then if I draw it, I would aim quite a bit straight to these days. Um, yeah. But yeah, intermediate target for me. Just, just to calibrate everything um, makes it much easier. Awesome. Uh, Steve said, does Zane's move off the ball a little? Do I move off the ball a little bit? Um, I think that's something I try and keep a mind on. I try, try to keep an eye on. I, sometimes I, if I'm not, not swinging very well, I, t- I, would, I would go a touch to the right and take it away. Um, yeah. So I just, but I just try and... I, I would consciously try and stay like really on it and so not move off the ball. Yeah. Uh, another question in the chat here, guys. Um, why does the S and T have a bad rap? Listening to Mike Weir on the podcast, he said it, he said he didn't lose his form from S and T, but through injury. Yeah, I listened to that one as well. I listened to that um, with with Mark and uh, Immelman. Um, yeah, I think. We spoke a little bit about this with Mike Navian last week, I think, with yeah. players from the system. And nobody's particularly negative about it and, and don't speak. I have not found anyone who speaks sort of badly of, of Andy and Mike. And I think that speaks volumes for them as a, not just as golf instructors, but as <clears throat> friends and, you know, they're good people. Um, as far as the injury thing's concerned, I mean, I think Mike Weir's injury stemmed from him hitting 
like a root of a tree or some kind of like yeah. bad injury. And then he said he struggled because he was taking deep divots. Well, that's not stack and tilt's fault, taking deep divots. I think if you watch the DVDs, Mike hits these high push draw four irons with the angle of attack at zero. Okay, so there's no, if you understand how it all fits together, you certainly don't need to be steep. I did a video about this last week talking about the driver. Some of you may have seen it. You know, the angle of attack is, is not steep just because you have your weight forward. Yeah. So I think that was a misunderstanding maybe. And, and I, I think I also said on another question, I've had this asked recently, players, Zane, Zane talked about this a second ago, like players on the range of a golf tournament, they'll try and see through, see things through their own filter to try and just help them make sense of what's going on in their world. And that just might be his way of saying, okay, I needed to finish this and I needed to try something new. Um, I certainly don't think it's valid that you're going to take bigger divots because you're using stack and tilt. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Uh, I, I would agree with that. And the injury thing, I, I think is like a, it's, it saved me. I, I, I wouldn't be playing, um, I, I don't think I, I wouldn't play very much doing what I used to do 10 years ago. And it's only through the understanding that we, we have these days that I'm able to keep on playing golf, really. Yeah, that's really good to hear. And there's a comment in the chat there, Zane, about from Thomas Stanley. He says stack and tilt was the cure for his sciatica, so many benefits. I could go on and on. I think that's so good to hear because it does get that unfair accusation sometimes that it's actually bad for your body. And I would, I would argue the complete opposite. Yeah, I mean, I would, uh, yeah, exactly. I, I actually, when I had my wrist injury, it was probably off, off a bit of an info from a tour coach uh, who told me to do something. And, I, you know, I did do that, like, did get really steep on it. Um, and it was someone who's probably quite anti stack and tilt, uh, anti that, you know, that's, that, that way of playing golf. Uh, and I actually, that did actually, you know, cause me quite a bad injury. So if I'd known what I'd known then, I wouldn't have gone down that route and I wouldn't have got injured. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I think there's no sort of scientific uh, evidence that anyone that does stack and tilt causes injury. I think it's probably the opposite. I know we've had a lot of seminars with Dr. Bush, who explains the anatomy in a lot better way than we can. But um, there's definitely all the movements of stack and tilt within the range of the normal body's movements. So um, certainly, I think it helps a lot of people, if anything. So it's almost the opposite to what is people are led to believe for whatever reason. I think maybe those injuries for some people have come from them trying to interpret what stack and tilt is on their own without visiting a coach. And I'd always say it's always important to, if you can get in contact with a instructor in your area or online, um, just to finish up guys, um, Zane, you, you've been doing a bit of online coaching. Is that right? Recently? Yeah. I've, I've done a bit online coaching for a little while and then during the lockdown, it kind of really, uh, really ramped up. And, yeah. uh, it's become quite, you know, quite a big part of the business now, and I, I, I enjoy it because I've had some success from it. You know, I would pass it on. It's been, it's been really, really good. I really, I enjoyed doing it, and uh, I've been getting quite a lot of good feedback from people because obviously you can reach, you can reach per, people further the than world. the thirty-minute radius of where we live now. So um, yeah, yeah it's, it's really cool. You know, you can someone can, you guys can be in Singapore, and you can, I might need help, and you can check my golf swing and send it back yeah. to me. Yes. Uh, it's definitely, it's definitely a way to go. And what also is great about it is that you get, when you get that lesson back, so you get a review back of your golf swing or something like, uh, I would like do a video for somebody. You get that lesson over and over. Um, yeah. When you go to the range, you can have a quick look and check it. So we know as golfers, we, we all like, you know, have a lesson then. You forget all the little details, don't you? And you, yeah. don't, you don't hit it quite as well as you did in the lesson. And then when you go back, you go in with the whole story of like, I'm just not hitting it as well as last time. And then the coach will say to you, do you remember just remember we said about putting your hands forward and you're like oh that's what it was so you can kind of have that coach in your ear yeah um scenario awesome yeah, so good. how about you guys are you got you guys doing some now as well sorry yeah. sorry say that again yes yes um the question was about coaching. online yeah question oh was yeah about online yeah yeah, yeah fun. I've, Really enjoyed it, actually. Been uh, something new. I've not had the time really to do it since being in Singapore much because of um, I'm so busy in the centre, really, from day to day um, normally. And so it's been great. Yeah, I've got um, nearly uh, 10, nine or 10 students now kind of on the books, which is brilliant. It's a perfect number for me, really. It's a nice balance between 
being able to give them the attention they need and still be able to you know, look after normal business once it resumes. So it's been great. It's been really interesting as a coach as well to sort of change your delivery maybe because you can't put your hands on someone and move them how you want yeah. them to move. I think it really challenges your ability to be direct, clear, concise, very specific about what you want someone to do. And then, as you say, that player, that person's got the, the message. They can play it back and play it back. And it's been much more of a back and forth, little and often type of relationship, more than a once a week or once a fortnight where you see someone for one hour kind of solid. And that's been interesting because yeah. it's quite it's worked well. I think also having the system to coach with and the explanation of the grid and things like that, I think it does help when you're coaching, especially online with the language you use. Uh, a lot of people I work with watch my videos so I can always refer back to things that I've done in another video or a certain drill that I've done so certainly it's helped me I, my, the only worry for me is once I go back to work here in Singapore is if I'm gonna have much time to do the online stuff but um because we're pretty busy in the center but I've, I've really enjoyed it in the lockdown it's, it's kept us sort of busy as such um, I know you guys are back to work now doing a bit of coaching and a little bit of playing we're hoping that that's going to happen very shortly, but we, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, just to finish up, guys, uh, a couple of questions. Uh, Steve in the chat asking about his hands going down the line and turning over. I think the best drill for that is when you get a player that holds the shaft on the um, target side of the, the player just to help them stay on the grid. Uh, the umbrella yeah. drill is good for that. I don't know if Steve watched last week. You can go back and watch the talk we had with Mike Navian last week because Mike shared my gears pictures, which is exactly the drill I was working on. Yeah. So and and that question's come up again from the Lynx Lizard where it says Rob's arms finish much higher at P ten. I just saw that when I was watching those three swings, and that's something I really struggle with. Like my arms getting off the grid seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Um, so I use that drill a lot. My arms need to finish much lower. Um, so Steve, uh, that's the drill. Um, yeah, figure that one out because that that will help a lot if you can do that drill. And uh, Yumi's just joined the joined the call, so she's a bit late. But hi, Yumi. <laughs> Hope you're right. So the lay in. She's had a Kobe's let her stay in bed tonight today. But to be fair, it's uh, early morning there on the west coast. But anyway, guys. Uh, Really enjoyed chatting to you, Zane. It was really great to have you on. I really appreciate you taking time to come and chat to us. Um, I know you're a busy guy, so I really do appreciate that. Mate. Thank you very much. I will post some links uh, for your social media and online co coaching business on, on the chat, if you don't mind, uh, in great. the description. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me on. Enjoyed um, catching up with you boys right from across the world. Well, hopefully one day we'll we'll get to we'll get to meet in person and maybe play some golf. You never know. Yeah, go and hit hit some nice tight draws. <laughs> I don't want to film up on the course. I was going to say I'm not having my swing film next to Zane's ever, never, ever. <laughs> no, I don't remember that. I saw that move. That was a good move you got on that one. <laughs> All right, cheers, good guys. Thanks everyone watching. Thanks for your comments. Uh, we'll see you again soon. Good to catch up, guys. See ya. Cheers, Thanks, guys. Nick. Cheers, guys. Thanks, Zane.